While ships join battle today at a distance of over 1,000 kilometers, four centuries ago, they confronted each other in deadly close combat battles. One ship was perfectly designed for that type of fighting, the galley. In the 17th century, France had 40 galleys in a corps commanded by a general of the galleys. The corps was made up of three types of ship. The ordinary galley, the ultimate battleship. The patron galley for the commanders of the corps. And the royal galley for the use of the king, queen and royal princes. The ship originated in the Mediterranean in the year 600 BC and was designed for close combat. The galley was a combat weapon. The idea was to surprise the enemy ships, to sail around them, to surround them if they were isolated ships, and then to ram them. The strength of the galley lay in its impact because you had to smash into the enemy galley at right angles. Smashing into the opposing ship meant ramming it at full speed. So the galley was shaped to glide over the waves. The slender hull, eight times longer than it was wide, offered exceptional hydrodynamic performance. Its low height in the water gave the oars maximum lever effect. Finally, this ship weighing just 250 tons had two means of propulsion. The galleys had one or two masts with triangular sails. And as soon as there was a bit of wind, they put the sails up. But the main characteristic of the galley was the oars, the human propulsion. An ordinary galley had 51 oars, 26 on one side and 25 on the other. Each oar was 12 meters long and weighed up to 130 kilograms. With five rowers per oar, 255 men were required to crew the ship. They would stand up and use all their body weight and they would hold their oar in which there were wooden structures called palamons, which they'd grip with their hands, and then they'd push the oar all the way forward and pull it back towards them. And that's how they made the galley advance. A good rower was a man with big thighs, rather than big arms, because basically it's the strength in the legs, the thighs, which make the ship move faster, and the arms just go with the oar. At full speed, the galley could reach six knots or 11 kilometers per hour, fast enough to seriously damage the opposing ship on impact. While the slender hull allowed it to go fast, its low height in the water meant it couldn't sail outside the Mediterranean. Galleys stayed close to shore. They weren't seagoing ships. In winter, they stayed in port. If it was windy, they couldn't sail, so galleys weren't used often. The reason the galley fell from favor wasn't its poor nautical qualities, but its limited firepower. The problem with the galley was that you needed space for the oars and for the artillery. So the galley's artillery was packed into the bow. When two fleets of galleys confronted each other, they did so facing each other because of their cannons. The idea was to weaken the enemy before close combat. It was fairly tokenistic because once you fire a cannon, you have to reload it. And it was very difficult to reload a cannon on a galley. From 1680, galleys were no longer used in the front line as they didn't have enough cannons. The ship was abandoned after reigning over the Mediterranean for two millennia. The firepower of today's warships is impressive like that of the multi-purpose frigate that protects the aircraft carrier. The Frem is without doubt the best surface combat ship today. 
in the frigate class. It's able to handle all the current threats with its extremely powerful weapons. On the sides, two 12.7mm guns ensure close protection. At the stern, two 20mm remote-controlled guns allow automatic firing with target locking by day and by night. More imposing, on the bow is a 75mm gun with a range of 30 kilometers. It can destroy land, sea or airborne targets. Against aircraft, there are 16 Aster missiles which can reach 3,500 kilometers per hour. Finally, the frigate has 16 naval cruise missiles to strike targets over 1,000 kilometers away. Ship's armament is the result of a long technical evolution. The first cannons, also called mouths of fire, appeared in the 14th century. Made from strips of wrought iron assembled by hand, it wasn't rare for them to explode on firing. So, for a long time, people were reluctant to load these weapons onto ships. In the 15th century, cannon manufacturing methods improved. Made from a new bronze alloy, they became safer and more precise. They were installed in large numbers on sailing ships with high freeboard, or height above the water. Unlike galleys, they had no oars, and so had space for artillery weapons along their sides. So began a new era, that of sailing ships and their powerful artillery, which were to dominate the seas for the next three centuries and change the art of war. The history of these warships began in the late Middle Ages. It started in the late 15th century and early 16th century with the appearance of the galleon, which was very archaic. It was quite a big, rounded, bulging ship with castles fore and aft. The wide decks could take a large number of artillery weapons. However, their weight raised the ship's center of gravity and destabilized it. The solution was found in the late 15th century with a simple but revolutionary idea, the invention of the gun port. The gun port was a rectangle of wood which the shipwrights cut into the hull. When the gun port was closed, you couldn't distinguish it from the rest of the hull. Then in battle, you raised this sort of shutter. You pushed the barrel into the hole, loaded the cannonball, and fired. The introduction of the gun port was fundamental. If the cannons had stayed on the decks, it would have been impossible to increase their weight because of the ship's stability. If you put heavy weights high up, obviously the ship will have a tendency to list or even to sink. Placing the cannons below decks lowered the center of gravity and therefore you could increase the weight and also the caliber of the cannons. The caliber of the artillery progressed rapidly. In 1638, the largest cannon was a 12-pounder. It fired a cannonball weighing six kilos. Seven years later, the 18-pounder cannon appeared. And in 1682, the most powerful piece of artillery was made with a caliber of 36 pounds. This three-meter-long colossus fired a cannonball weighing 18 kilos over 300 meters. The cannon alone weighed three and a half tons. With all the equipment, it was closer to six or seven tons. So it was huge, and that was why 15 men were needed to service each 36-pounder. Cannons of the same caliber were installed in batteries. The lightest were positioned on the upper deck and the heaviest on the lower deck. Each battery was made up of two broadsides, one on either side. At the end of the 17th century, the larger ships had up to three batteries, giving them the impressive number of 100 cannons. As these ships were more stable than galleys, the cannons were more effective. They could fire further and with more precision. They could fire further because they were higher in the water, so that's 
ballistics. And they could have more precision because as the platform was more stable, they could be aimed more accurately. Combat at sea was changing. They weren't trying to board each other's ships anymore. They weren't trying to get close to each other. On the contrary, they were keeping at a distance and fighting in what would become the famous line of battle, which developed in the late 17th century and would continue in all its glory until the end of the 18th century. From 1664, boarding, with its risky outcome, gave place to the tactic known as line of battle. You had about 40 or 50 ships divided into three groups, the vanguard, the battle corps, and the rear guard, which had to fight the enemy in the same way. And the two squadrons sailed past each other, then turned around and did the same in the other direction. So you had battles lasting 10 or even 12 hours. You weren't seeking to systematically destroy the others. You wanted them to retreat, showing that you were the strongest. You occupied that area, and you were sovereign in that particular place. 